Gràcies. Bona tarda a tothom. Good afternoon to everybody. So, uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, we are following with our uh, our round tables, our, our discussions on the hottest issues we have in the world nowadays. Uh, remember that this is something organized by the Barcelona Knowledge Hub of the Academia Europea. We are situated at the Fundació Catalana per la Recerca i la Innovació. And uh, we are very, very extremely grateful, first to our sponsors, Ajuntament de Barcelona, Generalitat de Catalunya, and to the Royal Academy, the RACAP, Royal Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, where the, the, that is where we are right now. Uh, most of us are amazed, even if we come to this room very often. And today I have something interesting to tell you, is that uh, a month ago, or three weeks ago, we had a very, very interesting talk by a member of the Academy explaining us all the, all the pictures around. And now the, this talk is in the web side of the academy so if you want to understand why all these things the meaning and the reasons for all that go to the the rack up and you will find this talk uh, by artur ramon that is 30 minutes and is fantastic it's a it's a very very nice talk explaining all that and explaining mainly why uh, something that looks much older was done at the time it was. So we had the celebration uh, of 100 years of, of, the, of the new decoration. It was called like that. Okay, so today uh, we have one of the th three main lectures for the challenges. We had already one that, is, uh, that was, I don't remember which, the ecological collapse and today we are for the second which is the most uh the most white white uh white spoken on the on the uh the artificial intelligence to which extent this is such challenging or not we don't know but most people think so so uh, the other day, myself, I was saying that of one of the, the, the interesting experiences for myself to have lived till the age I have now is to have been able to begin seeing artificial intelligence as an as a incredible experience in, in our life. What will be in the future, this is something that you, Patricia, will have to try to get for the two speakers today. So uh, I leave you with Patricia Ventura. She is a very well, uh, uh, she is a person that is in the right position in the sense that knowing a lot on artificial intelligence is a journalist. Thank you very much for being here, Patricia. Thank you, Jaume, for your kind presentation. I'd like to, to thank um, also um, Academia Europea Knowledge Hub for inviting me here and I'd like to thank also everybody here both those attending in person and, and those joining us virtually. Can a machine think? This is a key question for artificial intelligence governance because the more we accept that a machine can think and therefore replace a human being, the more we will delegate to it. It is the same question that Alan Turing, the father of artificial intelligence, posed in 1950. And it was Turing himself who proposed a formula to find out. It was the so-called Turing test which consisted of a person interviewing another person and a machine using a keyboard. 
if the interviewer was unable to identify through the answers on his monitor who was the person and who was the machine, then the machine could be considered intelligent. In other words, Turing proposed that if a machine behaves intelligently, it is intelligent, or in other words, that a simulation of intelligence is comparable to intelligence itself. In the end, the question whether machines can think became the question that has dominated the philosophy of AI, since throughout history there have been several refutations to Turing's approach, and the debate continues until today. The most important objections were those made by philosophers Herbert Dreyfus and John Searle um, in the uh, 1960s and 1980s, respectively. In short, they agreed that a machine could not think because it cannot understand the world in the same way a human being does, and that at most the machine could simulate. Later, they, Cyril and, and Dreyfus, they also recited other types of objections and the debate, as I said, I just said, it continues today. In fact, this dilemma of the thinking machine is experiencing one of its most effervescent moments. These days, the companies developing those large language models such as OpenAI proclaim they have achieved or they are about to achieve uh, the, the thinking machine, or in other words, general artificial intelligence, which is an intelligence capable of carrying out any task a human person would. The fact is that there is still no completely cl conclusive answer to the dilemma of, of thinking machines, but these systems are increasingly present in our lives, performing more and more tasks until recently, it was unthinkable that they could be delegated to machines. Perhaps the economic values of our system have something to do with it. Time is money, and AI substitution reduces time. It is no coincidence that OpenAI defines general artificial intelligence as, I quote from its website, highly autonomous systems that outperform humans at most economically valuable work. Artificial intelligence has become omnipresent in practically all sectors, industry, health, finance, or transport, integrating itself into systems in, and processes in an increasing and continuous manner from algorithms that manage large amounts of data to technologies that automate everyday tasks, AI, artificial intelligence, is present in tools, applications, and platforms that we use every day, such as recommendation systems in online stores, social ne networks or dating apps, search engines, or more recently, generative AI apps. In short, AI has become an essential part of the infrastructure of many modern industries and services, as well as the daily life of any person. In all those years, in all these years, this discipline has not ceased to surprise us with, with impressive ap applications, such as precision canes that allow blind people to detect obstacles, neuroprotheses that can be controlled with the mind, digital biomarkers to detect Parkinson, applications for the fight against bacteria and viruses, for the early diagnosis of autism, in a multitude of entertainment applications, as support for different areas of scientific research or in assistance in medical decision-making, among many others. At the same time, though, we have also seen the risks involved in certain uses, such as AI applied to military use with devastating effects in terms of human rights. We have seen this in the war in Gaza, where systems have been used whose criteria are not transparent and the supervision of their lethal decisions is relative, as the military in charge themselves have recognized. Or artificial intelligence applied to environments of labor exploitation in companies where workers must, workers must wear devices that monitor all their movements and control the time they dedicate to each task. 
Certain predictive systems have also been questioned. For example, Biogen, uh, used by the Spanish police to combat gender violence, since it has already made several mistakes that have cost even people their lives. Or Bosco, the system that denied access, access to it to pay the electricity bill to people who actually met the requirements to benefit from it. This type of use by public administration highlights the strong connection that artificial intelligence has with bureaucratic management, the tool for austerity, the promise of optimization and savings that will solve the lack of resources. This, thus, in light of different cases such as this, it invites us to ask ourselves if we are delegating excessively and if we are leaving behind an important part of decision making, which is the human factor. Furthermore, taking into account that it is precisely the most disadvantaged people who tend to need public services the most. It, at least, it also leads us to ask ourselves if AI can contribute to increasing inequalities, if this automation can lead us to a kind of dystopia in which people are managed by machines and without the power to respond. Despite everything, we cannot help but marvel when we hear things like robots that improve the quality of life of children with cancer, with autism spectrum, spectrum disorder, or that cognitively stimulate the elderly. Although, in the case of the elderly, on the other hand, they are in great need of company and often vulnerable. Can we qualify as real the conversations between people and machines? Or is there a risk of making these people, many of them with impairmental faculties, believe that they are truly being accompanied? There are people who even maintain emotional relationships with machines. How deep could this, can this relationship be? Will we end up believing us kind of Turing test proposed that a simulation can replace reality? And this substitution of the human being in its most human characteristics can lead us to ask ourselves to what extent are there red lines? This is probably one of the great dilemmas of our era. A dilemma that not only affects the present but points to an even more uncertain future. The advance of artificial intelligence is something that we still do not know how it will affect us if a country decides to set limits uh, and stop developing or using certain applications, it will not prevent our co other countries of doing so, which creates competition at a global level. Therefore, it is important that all countries agree to establish ethical rules to en that ensure that these technologies are developed responsibly and safely. Well, although it's not possible to predict uh, the future with certainty, the best way to anticipate it is by relying on the criteria of experts. Foreseeing this ubiquity of AI, our speakers today, Ramon, professors Ramon Lopez de Mantaras and Professor Lux still have long thought that it was necessary to establish a governance framework to be able to incorporate this type of technology safely in a way that guarantees innovation and at the same time respect for the rights and freedoms of citizens. This vision materialized in, materialized in 2017 in the Barcelona Declaration, which became the president to the European Union Declaration on Responsible AI, the European Union Trustworthy AI Guidelines, and the subsequent EU AI Act, the most important AI regulation in the world, which provides a framework for developing AI that is lawful, ethical, and robust. To address the challenges that artificial intelligence poses for the coming decades, we now have two pioneers, both in AI research and in the ethical reflections associated with its development. After their presentations, there will be a session for interventions for the attending audience. First of all, we will have here uh, and welcome Ramon, Professor Ramon Lopez de Mantaras. He's founder and former 
Director of the Artificial Intelligence Research at the Spanish National Research Council, Consejo Superior de Investigaciones Científicas, member of the Institute for Catalan Studies, the Institut d'Estudis Catalans, Master of Science, Computer Science from the University of California, Berkeley, PhD in Physics from the University of Toulouse, France, and PhD in Computer Science from the Polytechnic University of Catalonia. He has made scientific contributions in the field of artificial intelligence since uh, 1976. He's an honorary member of the European Association for Artificial Intelligence and recipient for, of several awards, including the Robert S. Engelmore Award from the American Association for Artificial Intelligence, the Donald E. Wolk Walker Distinguished Ser Service Award from International Joint Conference on Artificial Intelligence and the National Research Pla Prize, Julio Rey Pastor, in Mathematics and Information Technologies. Ramon Lopez de Mantaras, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let me unmute it. Okay. Good. Good evening, thanks, Patricia. Um, before I start uh, showing some slides uh, about uh, some thoughts on the social how challenges impact of artificial intelligence, I would like to say, first of all, that uh, artificial intelligence is unfortunately uh, not a very fortunate term. It's Obviously, now it is, doesn't make any sense to try to, to change it. It has been around since 1956. But uh, I wish I, it, it could have been called another you know, different way, this, this, this field, okay? This field of, of, of technology of science. Because the way it is called, it uh, leads very, very fast, very easily to anthropo anthropomorphization. And this is a cause of confusion and uh, lots of, uh, in my opinion, lots of problems. And, and, and it also provokes lots of, uh, let's say, uh, high expectations uh, that um, we have had already in the history of, of this field, uh, at least a couple of times, these very high expectations turn out then to be uh, uh, what is called AI winters because they were not fulfilled. Now we are in the middle of a huge hype, uh, in my opinion, higher than previous hypes. And uh, we'll see what will happen in the future. Mm. I obviously, I, I'm, a, I'm not a prophet. I cannot tell you what will happen in the future, but I have some suspicion that uh, the present AI by bubble will deflate, will deflate, slowly deflate, and we'll see. We'll see what will be the consequences of that. We will have certainly new things coming in, coming into the field of AI, uh, but uh, in particular, what is called what is called generative AI, that is the one that everybody all of a sudden is aware. And many, many people, anyone almost, uh, ordinary people, uh, for the first time have, uh, are, let's say, conscious, uh, are aware that they are dealing with an artificial intelligence or something that is called artificial intelligence, although it's incapable of any reasoning, of any understanding. So, uh, in my opinion, let me open a parenthesis. I have to say that um, Jan Likun says that we, uh, generative AI is an off-ramp towards the goal of reaching arti general artificial intelligence. My opinion is not only an off-ramp, it's a 180 degrees turn. Because in the past, we were capable of building, we were, using, we were building not with 100% success, I would say, but systems that, that somehow they were capable of reasoning, dealing with knowledge, planning, uh, some, some capability, let's say, emulating or simulating 
cognitive capabilities. And now this generative AI, at least in what concerns the, the, the large language models, are not capable of that. They are not doing any reasoning and they are not understanding anything of the language. Although it looks like, it seems that they understand, but they do not understand. Uh, okay, to elaborate more on that would be another talk. So, so I want, I'm going to stop here. Just uh, this, let's say, introduction, preamble. Uh, leaving clear that what is going on now in AI, in my opinion, scientifically speaking, is of little interest. Okay? What will happen possibly in the future is that uh, these efforts will be joined, we will, re we will rediscover, uh, rediscover the will possibly, and uh, we will see hybrids of, uh, of this massive data based, based on lots of data to train systems, and only generative AI and all these uh, other other technologies around the, that have in common that they, they are based on what is called deep deep neural networks, they will be uh, integrated with let's call it more old-fashioned AI, more classical AI. And maybe as a result of this integration, something really more interesting scientifically, at least speaking, will come out. Will come out. I don't know. Uh, I hope so. Uh, and also, if we, uh, and, and then, if on top of that, we integrate uh, a multisensorial body into the AI, so we do embodied AI, then we can go still much, much, much farther than what we have now, achieving some sort of true understanding. Okay. Now, let me say something about the, about the, the social issues, social impacts, social challenges. Uh, to start with, artificial intelligence is not as artificial as it seems, neither. Not as intelligent as it seems, but it's neither not as artificial as it seems. This, is, uh, this appeared in Washington Post in August 2023. Uh, there is another paper on Harvard Business Review entitled, with, uh, along the same lines, entitled The People Behind the AI Curtain, that shows that there are not thousands or tens of thousands, even millions of people. In, this shows a cyber cafe in Kenya. Uh, and in Kenya, I estimate there are two million people that are uh, making this generative AI work, finally. They are uh, providing answers, they are giving answers by the, AI, by, the gen, the, by the large language models. They say which answers are, are good, which answers are not good. In case no answer is good, because they are given several, they, they, are, they are asked to provide an appropriate answer. Okay? Uh, not only that, for future, for future uh, mm, autonomous uh, vehicles, they are also uh, labeling, labeling uh, uh, images, okay? This is a tree, this is a pedestrian, this is a car, this is a red light, blah, 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 no? And they spend, they spend hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. By the way, paid uh, less than one dollar an hour in this, uh, the, the, this, this, this uh, Washington, Washington Post article was about the situation and how badly are these people treated. So in this, they call it digital sweatshops. Um, uh, let me add on, on that subject that, you know, uh, when we talk about AI and the impact of AI, we, we, we even we don't explicitly say we are talking about the, the global north. Very rarely we think of the global south. And uh, this is an example of what is going on with the impact of AI in the global south. Uh, quite a sad example, by the way. Okay. So I said before that AI is not truly intelligent, but it's even less artificial than what it seems. Another impact that I wanted to, you know, to, to single out today is everybody probably has heard about that, is the impact of energy. 
but what is more interesting in this, what I show here, is the right, the right one, the Guardian. This is very, very recent. Please don't write data. It was maybe a couple of months ago or so. It says that uh, the big tech claims are untrue. Okay? Because the real emissions are almost seven times almost eight times, I would say, higher than what they claim. So they are not telling the truth, because they are not interested in telling the truth. Not only on energy consumption, but in many other things, by the way, in many other things. Um, when they tell about their, the, how, how wonderful is the AI they are developing, well, there are no ways of really trying to, 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 to test it. You know, there is a problem, it's called the measurement problem in AI. There are no good ways, independent ways of testing these systems. You know, no way. Many of the benchmarks are suffer what is called data contamination, in the sense that uh, in the training, in the training, the corpus of training, the training set, already the, ans the, the questions and the answers are there or if not little, if not exactly, the patterns are there. The patterns are there. And that, that was shown very clearly by Rao Kambampati, former IAAAI president, in a recent paper in the association, in the main conference of the, on, on computational linguistic of the ACL, the Association, association of Computational Linguistics, showing by means of what's called the counter, counterfactual benchmark that these uh, systems don't understand anything in when they give a good answer is because the answer, the question and the answer was already in the training set. So they recover patterns that were in the training set. Violating one of the main principles of machine learning, that you have to be very careful and you have to, to be careful and the, the, the sets, the training set and the test set have to be disjoined to avoid this data contamination. In many of the benchmarks that they are using today with this large language model, this is not the case. Okay, so the impact on, let's come back to the impact on energy because I can, I get, make this digression because of this, this, this let's say, half truths or not complete truths that the big tech are, are, are saying, right? On the left, you can see how the ranking if you, if you add up the 24 terawatts, these are terawatts eh, of Google plus the 24 of Microsoft plus the 12 of Meta plus the 2 of Apple, and there are not all here, the, 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 all the big techs, right? It turns out that uh, there would be approximately in the 20th, 20 something position in the world. That means that only 19 countries have a higher consumption than the data centers of these big tech. All the remaining approximately 200 countries consume less. Okay. This is un completely unsustainable. Completely unsustainable. And this is because of these uh, GPUs that are very energy demanding, as you know. Uh, and we have to, to, something has to be done. Science, in that case, I think science might, might provide answers, changing technology. Silicon-based technology, uh, I, I, hardly th I can hardly uh, think that it will be the solution. We have to think of completely different technologies. I don't know which ones. Photonics, perhaps, other ways of computing, other ways of, of having hardware to do this computation, not necessarily silicon. Silicon, as we can see, is very high, high energy demanding. Because although it's true that the GPUs uh, the, uh, in the last year, uh, they have went down to 30% of consumption, each individual CPU, GPU, the problem is that even a single unit is 30% less, but the number of units has increased much more. So the overall, the overall is increasing, 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 increasing the, the energy demands, and this is unsustainable. Impact on education. I think this is very important impact to and social impact to talk or, or to talk about. 
uh, is not a very good idea to delegate writing to LLMs. This is the nature. This is a nature paper, nature human behavior. And uh, I single uh, on, the right, on the right, I made like a zoom of, <laughs> of a section of this paper. Uh, and you can, you, can see, you can look at, you can read it by yourself, right? So this, this the, how important is the writing for thinking? And if you stop, of your, the, they say decrease the effort in writing, you may, you may risk, the, you may, the, you risk losing uh, such a fundamental uh, cognitive capacity as thinking. So it's not a very good idea then to, to delegate uh, writing tasks to these systems. Okay. Well, after all, impact on scientific research, although it doesn't necessarily impact directly to the ordinary people, indirectly, for sure, it impacts, right? Look at the left. Uh, the one that is very worrying is the one on the left. There was a project, a huge project, involving many, many groups, many scientists, many groups from different universities, uh, uh, analyzing the, uh, the, lang the human language usage. It has been shut down. Obvious why? Obviously, it's obvious why it was shut down. Because now the percentage of non-human non generated language in internet is so huge that it falsifies all, all, all the, the, the findings of this project. Because there is no longer, they, can, they cannot rely that the, 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 all the corpus, all the text that it, they are using as they, they are analyzing is not, a huge percentage is not human generated. So they stopped the project. And then, of course, uh, anyone that has had, uh, 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 many of you for sure, uh, has been performing duties as a reviewer of papers for journals and on conferences, now we have a problem because AI is spamming a lot of these uh, papers that makes no sense that have been partially, at least partially, generated with these systems. This is particularly interesting because it was published in Nature. And supposedly, I thought that, well, Nature, as any other journal, uh, Nature, you can, you can sometimes can make mistakes, obviously nobody's perfect. But look, in December 23, a couple of uh, published uh, articles that were uh, uh, highly published in, in, uh, were in the news, they claim to have discovered more than 2.2 million, 2.2 million new materials using AI. And they had automatically synthesized 41 of these new materials. But unfortunately, these claims were debunked quickly. Most of these materials were misidentified. The rest were already known. And when they, exam when they, detail they make an ex a detailed examination of, of 250 uh, uh, of them, uh, they were mostly junk. So this is, was this was debunked by the in this journal Chemistry of Materials, right? So be careful when you use this this system. You have to be. I mean, critical thinking is fundamental to use. I don't say don't use GP, don't, don't use language models. Yeah, you may find some some practical use of it. Maybe they can improve a little with your English. Maybe they can help you to write, I don't know, uh, 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 an email or some not very important things. Uh, but be careful on, on asking him to write serious things, okay? Serious things. Um, well, this has to do, this is from The Economist, has to do with what I said before about the spamming of the publication, the poor quality papers. Uh, 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 boosting plagiarism and, and jamming the machinery of scientific progression, jamming the, the review process, for example. For, uh, uh, you see, science already are, is imposing, uh, imposing onerous disclosure on, on the papers they, they receive. And finally, this, uh, as I said at the beginning, I, I, I think the generative AI bubble is, is deflating. And I, it's, not, it's not my intuition, it's because I try to, to be up to date, up to date of what is going on. And you can see here, for example, even Goldman Sachs says that AI is overhyped, wildly expensive and unreliable. And the Wall Street Journal says early adopters of Microsoft's AI bot wonder if it's worth the money. Okay. 
So many people, and, and particularly investors, are realizing that, after all, maybe the return of investment, the ROI, is not clear on, on generative AI. And I think that, they, for, to me, these are uh, indicators that something is going, ha is going to happen in the terms of this deflating this, uh, this bubble. Okay, there are many other things that maybe will come out later on the debate about you know privacy issues, uh, biases, impact on labor market, impact on democracy. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to show just a few a few things. And just just this is a sort of a funny, in my opinion, is a little bit funny uh, thought about that. You no, know? this is a science a science fiction writer that's something that I thought funny, but when, funny at the, uh, at the first glance, but then when you think of it, it's not, it touches some, some important issue. Yeah? Maybe you know, we are not pushing AI in, uh, in the right direction. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for your talk. Thank you. Um, I remind everybody that after their presentations, there will be a session for interventions and questions from the audience. Uh, now we have here uh, Professor Luke Stills. Luke Stills was ICREA Research Professor at IBE, the Institute of Evolutionary Biology, CSIC, Universitat Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona. He has worked for 50 years in artificial intelligence. He was a student in computer science and artificial intelligence at MIT in the 70s, advised by Marvin Minsky. Researcher at the geophysics company Schlumberger in the early 1980s, professor and founding director of the AI laboratory at the Free University of Brussels. In the 1980s, founding director of the Sony Computer Science Laboratory in Paris in the 1990s, and then ICREA Research Professor in Barcelona. His research work spans many areas of artificial intelligence, from knowledge-based systems and natural language processing to cognitive robotics and evolution language models. In 2013, he was awarded by the Eurai Distinguished Service Award, the highest achievement in artificial intelligence in Europe. He is chair of natural science and at the Royal Flemish Academy. Welcome, Luke Stills. The floor is yours. Hello, hello. Yes. Okay, well, first of all, I, I thank the organizers, and it's for me a great honor to be here. I, I'm delighted that I discovered this place. I know the Ramblas, of course, but I've never been here. It's beautiful and encouraging, uh, good scientific discussion. Um, so, um, I think today, we indeed have a very important topic. And um, I'm going to also make remarks which are actually very much in the spirit of what Ramon uh, just has come to say. Um, I also have a few slides, but I, I don't think I will use all of them. So I started in AI in uh, actually 72 or 73, something like that. Many of you, even though you're already a bit older, are probably not yet born. Um, and so I started in AI out of scientific interests in language, mind, uh, learning, you know. And I think also all the other people uh, had the same ambition, the same passion for understanding the mind using computers as a kind of microscope or telescope, if you want, uh, to, to try out theories. And um, 
And so AI kept developing actually a little bit in the shadow, relatively small. Um, and in the 80s, uh, Ramon and myself, we started having the first AI labs in Europe. It was very difficult because uh, many people, including many computer scientists, didn't want to hear of it. You know, there was basically a always a very much counterwind against what we were trying to do. And uh, there were some reports like the uh, in, in Britain and, and so on. Um, and then there was a first kind of boom, if you want, in the uh, 80s, early 80s, with uh, knowledge-based systems, expert systems. And I, I should say this, th this boom was actually serious in the sense that we worked on real applications. Uh, for example, uh, in my group, we worked on scheduling for the railways or diagnosis of uh, power plants, you know, technical things, and really trying to build applications that would support human experts in their tasks. And also listening to the experts and trying to model their expertise using their terminology. And so things have been going up and down. I mean, there's this summer and winter idea, but actually I think, you know, there's a steady development of AI. And uh, there's always been kind of two directions. I, I have them here on this slide as a sort of sub-symbolic stream of work. Um, and there's a symbolic stream of work. So the first one is associated with neural networks. And, uh, you know, it's data-driven. It's numerical, uh, and basically it uses a very empiricist view of knowledge. It's really uh, Hume and, you know, the, uh, the, the kind of inductive, um, uh, data-driven view of knowledge. Now then you have the, the symbolic line of work, and both of them go back to the 1950s. Uh, AI really started in 1950, with Claude Shannon, for example, as one of the important figures, also Turing. Um, when the symbolic is really more uh, looking at models, looking at theories, so it's theory-driven, symbolic representation, so it's more you know, discrete mathematics, if you want, whereas the sub-symbolic is more continuous mathematics. So you had these two streams of work, and each of them, you could say in, in the 80s, it was more the period of symbolic applications and uh, that line of work. But the two basically coexisted. I mean, this dichotomy which exists today was not there in the first decades of AI. I mean, people worked on both. Uh, Marvin Minsky, for example, built one of the first neural machines in 1952. He also wrote uh, books on, on perceptrons, you know, trying to th prove theorems. So it's not that Minsky was against neural networks. Also, people in neural networks were not necessarily against a symbolic view. But anyway, um, but what we see today is that this first line of work has kind of exploded. And uh, it, it is, I, I keep insisting on the fact that it's a sort of different epistemological view, right? Uh, this is the view of experience, of data, uh, of induction, and which you also see in, in the philosophy of science, history of science, you always had these two kinds of uh, ways of working. But so at the moment, this first um, approach is dominant, and in principle, this is fine, but it causes all sorts of limitations. And everybody who knows about statistics, and I think all of you do, you know that statistics has limitations, you know, for dealing with outliners, for having the right data. I mean, this is known. And so the, the, the systems that are currently on the market, let's say, and are being pushed, uh, are, have those limitations. I mean, they, we know them. Every scientist knows them. Um, but so 
there is indeed an incredible hype. And I think AI has become a victim, if you want, of two forces, very big forces. One of them is capitalism. Uh, you know, the billions being invested and the, again, I don't have to explain to you what capitalism is and what capitalism is doing to the world, right? And so this is an economical problem, if you wish. And the, the way Silicon Valley has always worked is with hype cycles, where a lot of investment is being made, you know, promises are made, uh, it's marketing, it's PR, to attract investments, and then companies are being sold, and then they collapse again. Of course, sometimes they work, but there's also a lot that do not work. So capitalism is one. The second, uh, let's say victim, <laughs> AI has become victim to another force, which is competition. Now, both of them are the forces that drive America, right? Competition is everything is turned into a competition instead of cooperation. And so competition means you have, uh, you know, uh, tests, you compete with each other. I'm 1% better than you are on that particular test. So if you go to AI papers, Ramon complained on, on the benchmarks and he's absolutely right. I mean, there are no good benchmarks, but groups are clustering on the benchmarks to be number one. And, but this does not necessarily give more insights or, you know, long-term depth in, in work. So I think these are two really very serious problems that we are facing uh, at the moment. And then the problem I think that society is facing is the, the, what we, the panel is about, namely, what is the social impact of all this? And I think my uh, worry, maybe I compare it to what happened in, uh, let's say, in agriculture. You know, at some point you had pesticides. And I think in the 1940s, maybe before 1950s, you know, everybody was amazed what these pesticides could do. And enthusiasm, a new industry grew up. Now, of course, at that time, biologists were already saying, now, wait a minute. I mean, you're destroying ecosystems. You're um, uh, tampering with evolution, normal evolutionary processes. So in fact, you, you will have short-term gains, but long-term damage. And then, so you had the first book books appearing like uh, Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. This is, I think, 1960 even, or something like that. Uh, you know, saying, be careful, wait a minute. Then, of course, today we know that, and, and a lot of biologists have, have said, try to convey this message, you know, be careful, you're, you're running into a, a destruction of ecosystems and in the limit in, into the collapse of species and all these kinds of things. Now, I think what we need to, we have the same message today. Now, AI is not destroying species, but is, is destroying something else, which has to do with culture, which has to do with language. This is the danger. And there are some people like Harari is, is one, who are, you know, his latest book, Nexus, is about that. And I think, uh, though you can criticize him at certain points because I think he doesn't know enough about AI itself, but his message is, is important and needs to be taken. And I think people like myself and Ramon and all, all my older colleagues, you know, they have the same message. That there's something going on which is not right. And um, now we, we can start talking about it, it is, of course, amazing that the effect of scaling up these AI techniques, it is amazing. And, um, but is it going to lead to, uh, to AGI, I mean, this artificial general intelligence? I just think 
what they want to do is to build a system that can ask, uh, that can answer any question in any domain in any language. Now, I mean, what about diversity of opinion? What about, you know, uh, well, of course, also language diversity. And language is more than words, right? It's a way of thinking and a way of conceptualizing the world. You cannot just mess that up. Uh, but so, is the scaling sustainable? I mean, Ramon addressed it. I won't talk about it more. The answer is no, of course. There's also, the, the, what is also amazing is the speed with which the applications are thrown in the world. I mean, it is like medicine or pesticides. Without testing, without any controls, they are spread like that. And the, the impact, it is not clear that they work. It's pretty sure they don't work, actually. But nevertheless, they are spread without any constraint. Again, this competition, you see, and this capitalism that is winner-take-all, trying to corner the market like Google has done for search. You know, it's also a rush to corner the market and then uh, control with a monopoly, control the production of and distribution of knowledge. We can't let that happen. Uh, now, the speed is not just how things are distributed, but also how fast users are picking up things, you know? And I mean, I had also some problems with the inundation in uh, Spain, you know, in uh, my house here. And so I was talking this morning with my plumber and my Spanish or Catalan is not yet, you know, up to that I can converse with uh, my plumber. And, you know, he, he took his phone, zoom, and basically, he did live translation, uh, you know, and spoke and, and took images and, and showed it to me, you see. I mean, that, that's, of course, amazing, right? With all the, the dangers of it, but uh, there is something very important that's happening. But the uh, but users, I mean, it is amazing how much it, it is rolling out in the world and applications are built. And also, the, the world, in a way, is ready for AI. But is AI ready for the world? I think it is not, you know. Even though that there's this kind of promise and we might build many good things, but the rush that is currently is something that I think is, is wrong. And then, I think also, no, we have been warning about problems, uh, a bit like Rachel Carson, you know? And people say, well, no, and... Uh, uh. But now we are already beginning to see that kind of thing. And Ramon has, has given examples of it. Um, yeah, well, the examples he gave is about pollution of information sources. And, you know, all of you use Google search, right? Well, I use it. A lot. And basically, it shows me websites, and I go to them, and then I check them. And I... Now, then they, uh, stimulated by OpenAI and ChatGPT and all that, Google also starts to give these textual, uh, you know. And now the whole thing is beginning, right? And this is about uh, an article, how many rocks should I eat each day? If you ask that question, it says, well, Google, huh? Uh, according to UC Berkeley, geologists, people should eat at least one small rock a day. Now, I, I mean, I can go on, you know, how to avoid that uh, pizza, the, the, the cheese slides from your pizza. The recommendation is to add glue to the pizza. And uh, it, it's funny, it's weird. But, you know, there, there are many answers that we don't see that, that it is weird because we are not experts. Say, so, well, we have to educate children to be more critical. But how can you educate? I mean, I would be fooled, right? If, if I get a recommendation, for example, on how to go from here to, I don't know, to Barcelona, let's say, and it sends me to some other place, right? 
So uh, this is this pollution. This is another example of the, the impact, negative impact, is that because of the, this is about the imagery, fake uh, video, fake images, you know that even images that are real are now no longer have the value that they used to have. And this is uh, from an example, this is Valencia, a real image, which then on social media, because you know we can have a whole story about social media also, another technology which I think is, is really going completely the wrong way. But anyway, these are all examples, there are many that, that we can give, so this pollution. The other one is the, then the unreliability of services that are built on top of uh, and, you know, up on top of ChatGPT, let's say. And so, um, well, this is an example. This is from, uh, when was it? A few days ago, right? Uh, yesterday, in fact. You know, a real estate agent uh, asks ChatGPT to make a listing of the buildings and then puts them on the description of the buildings on, on their website. Now, as you all know, ChatGPT just hallucinates, meaning, you know, it, it is not factual. Uh, and so, as a consequence, you get all sorts of trouble now with companies that are building on top of, they've been told uh, ChatGPT is, is an oracle that actually possesses the, the knowledge of the whole world, and then they use it, and they, you know, you get this kind of stuff. Uh, the impact on education has been mentioned. I mean, some, some colleagues, there was a, another meeting a few days ago in Brussels also, like, like this one on, on limitations of AI. And one colleague was talking about uh, the exams for logic. You know, logic, you have truth tables and you have, well, you know. Uh, and so, strangely enough, a lot of the students they had very bizarre answers for some of the questions. Now, it turned out that the students are studying with ChatGPT. So they, instead of taking notes or using a handbook, you know, which has been certified, they asked ChatGPT for example questions that were there in the past. They get an answer, they study that answer, and then they give it. But the answer is wrong. And so, I mean, this is just one impact. Uh, the other impact, which I think is even more serious, is the one you mentioned. If we don't exercise our mental capacities ourselves, we lose them. And uh, just like it's like the muscles, you know? And, um, okay, well, anyway. Now, I, I do, I don't know about the time. How, how many? Three, four minutes, okay, okay. Uh, well, we'll have some discussion after that also, I guess, okay. The, the, the final thing I want to say is about the value of human work. And one of the things I, I have been concerned with, sorry, a lot is in particular creative, results of creative work, uh, musicians, writers, uh, designers, you know. And, uh, I mean, there's a total panic in those fields. Why? Because what is the value of their work from the viewpoint of these big tech companies? It's easy. It's zero. You know, because they don't get any remuneration for their output, which is used for training. They, the things that are generated with AI are in direct competition on the market, like on Spotify. And so um, the, the value, the money, in other words, is shifting from human creators to the capitalist entrepreneurs. So there are uh, a, a colleague of mine, well, Francois, actually, Francois Pachet, who, who worked with Spotify, says there's already 30% of all the music on Spotify is already AI generated. And it's done by companies that are invisible, that are creating fake artists and use the, the, the voices, the styles and so on of real artists, you know, to produce music 
that then goes in direct competition. Now, what is the effect of that? Well, of course, it's a decrease of income for the people who live from their creativity. Uh, it's it's a, a decrease in the opportunities to exercise that creativity. And also the music itself, and the same is true for uh, other media, you know, is moving towards a kind of, uh, well, I don't know the right word, but the kind of common denominator. The creativity goes out of it because of the statistical uh, learning processes pushes towards, you know, the most common, right? The pattern that that is uh, at all the opposite of creativity. So, um, anyway, yeah. And there's also the, the issue of, of cultural transmission. You know, if the resources are not there to the human creators, we are losing the cultural transmission to create the next generation. So this is, this is not fear mongering, you know, this is reality. I mean, I can go into a lot more detail for music. Uh, this is from the studies of the associations of composers and performers. I mean, they see a drop in their uh, income and not a small one, eh? close to 30%. And we are talking for Europe on, uh, in billions of, of euros. I mean, the same, pack, same story for writers, translators. You know, the, the market of human translators is collapsing uh, dramatically. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to stop. So, well, I won't go into all this, but, you know, computer people might think that they're, you know, they're safe because they write computer programs. Well, actually, you know, programming itself is at the risk of becoming obsolete, which I find a really scary proposition. Because just like with the hallucinations in, you know, glue for, for pizza making, these, these programs that are built by AI contain subtle errors that if you are not an expert, you don't see them. Now, of course, the, the problem will come that there's a real bug and that like there was a, a month or two ago, hospitals had to close down, airports had to close down because of errors, you know, popping up in the software and particularly in the maintenance of software, you know, underlying systems change, so they have to be uh, debugged and so on. Well, I, I don't know, I, I, I will stop here, uh, but, uh, and, and we can go to the discussion, but I think my message is very clear. We need to think profoundly uh, ab about the future and not let ourselves be, be absorbed by this wave of Silicon Valley hype. Uh, but there's a big role, I think, for scientists but of course they need the resources also to, to do that, is to take a more neutral observation of what these systems can do and not do, and also lay the foundations of future AI, because clearly the world at the moment, you know, is, is asking for it, right? The problem is we are not ready with the kind of AI that would be safe, trustworthy, and, and particularly, we have to get it out of the hands of this capitalist logic, which is, is really destroying, um, I think, the, the you know, uh, many things which, which we should not, well, cultural things, language things, and so on. Thank you, Luke. So we will now begin the session for questions and interventions from the audience. Um, if anyone has a question uh, or comment, please uh, raise your hand. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you to both the speakers. I have a question. If I understood you correctly, uh, you have been saying there is something wrong or very wrong in the way that AI is being developed, but at the same time, it is allowed to be developed this way by the powers, whatever that means. And also, we are puzzled by the very rapid take-up, which you 
pointed out. What does it mean? Uh, does it point out to a sort of collective hallucination or collective mental illness? And in particular, as an example, what do you think about the fact that the Nobel Prize of Physics have been awarded to uh, a computer specialist on AI? You go first. Yeah, the, the, well, this, this lack of data, uh, so I think you're right in your, uh, your analysis. Now, there's a, a fundamental problem with, with the method that's now being used, which is completely empiricist methods. I mean, a lot of insights in science, you know, have come by thinking, right? and by ha making models and not, of course, also going to data and using data to, to then validate a model. Uh, but so the, and right now there's a belief that everything has to come out of data. And of course, uh, you cannot collect enough data. Uh, language is changing, the world is changing. There will never be enough data to do everything in a data-driven way. So there's a fundamental error already at, at the basis of this, uh, the, this current development. It's like a, a Fata Morgana. No, is that a good word? <laughs> you know, to be able to, to do that, to get enough data. Uh, language is a good example, eh? because language is changing all the time. And so, but now these systems uh, are not cumulative or, you know, that, this is one of the big problems. They train the whole thing with the old data. If you have new data, you have to restart the whole thing from the beginning and retrain, you know, with your old data and the new data, you see? So, I mean, well. There, uh, we call, it's called the, the what? Yeah. Oh, I I will use this one. Okay. It's called the model collapse. You know, you, you, the, all these uh, systems they generate, as uh, Luke has shown, this thing about the rock, the geologist, uh, you know, the, um, that eating rocks and all that. Uh, there are many, 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 there are lots of examples you can find about uh, this. They call it hallucinations. I don't like the word because it's a grand, an anthrop an anthropomorphization of the of the systems, which is that does not hallucinate at all, in the sense it makes it really it really generates nonsense. That's it, because of the way it is it is designed, it is built. You know, just uh, deciding what is the most probable continuation of 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 a, of, of a sentence or of a, this is in itself. It's, it's it's in my opinion, it's a very strong limitation. So the, top, the model collapse means that, that you generate lots of junk, lots of garbage, and then it will be used to train the next generation, the next, the next model. So now they say that OpenAI will, is training. Yes, they said I started to train GPT-5. Well, you know what the problem is? That GPT-5, the, the, training, the training data, the training corpus, is already, there are already such a huge amount of nonsense data, of garbage, junk already, that it will, it, it will be the input to, 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 to train GPT-5. And it will make things worse and worse. It's like a snowball effect, right? And I think this is, a, this is, this is it's just wrong approach. We are using a wrong approach in this, let's call it new, new, new AI. And then on the other hand, what is also worrying about the What's happening is that uh, is in the hands of a few big texts where where AI is going. It's no longer no longer in the hands of academia, or much less than before, at least, right? And of course, the interests are not the same. Hmm? Obviously, very different. Interests. That's why uh, the, for example, open AI, open AI with, with releasing GPT 3.3, the first one was 3 or 3.5 or 2, I don't remember anymore, it doesn't matter. What happened is that it deployed this on the wild in the middle of hundreds of millions of people using it. And this is against our first in the, in the Barcelona Declaration, 
the group, you remember what was the first principle? Prudence. And this is what they did not do. They did not, obviously, they didn't care. Pro I'm sure that Sam Alman didn't know anything about our, our the Barcelona Declaration, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but in any case, uh, they, 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 didn't, they didn't comply with, in our opinion, in the opinion of many other people, and many other similar declarations to our, to the one, in, to the Barcelona one, uh, they, they all mention that you have to be very careful, uh, have prudence, you know, evaluate, try to, to mi minimize the, 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 the impact, the risks of these of the systems. There are more questions. Yeah, so I stop. <laughs> Thank you, Ramon. And look, I think, I don't know if this microphone is working. I don't know if you hear me well. Um, we're going to, okay, so Jauma, I, I think this microphone, I don't, I'm not sure if it's working. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, extremely interesting. A uh, short time ago, in the same room, we had a, a debate on uh, hypothesis driven or uh, data driven mm. approaches in biology. The, what we are discussing now is much bigger than that because the one we could say is just a uh, uh, an academic discipline, and this, is, this seems to be just a way of thinking. And my question here would be very, very uh, incisive in the sense of saying. So mainly you, Ramon, but you also, Luke, have been uh, defending that no much new things will come up with artificial intelligence. But uh, and you have both been using uh, a word of understanding things. Mm -hmm. The point is, maybe we were thinking that things were much more complex than what artificial intelligence is showing us. So, for example, if language has no much structure, than putting one word after the other, as ChatGPT does, maybe this is a way of making language think, thinking on the complexity of language itself. So, to which extent uh, this kind of disruption as artificial intelligence uh, may show us uh, very big pictures on how really things are and not how we think things are. So maybe things are not, uh, are, are not in the way, so in a certain way, uh, you were like uh, talking as having a, 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 a cloud of complexity that we don't reach them, but our mind can approach that, but artificial intelligence cannot. And maybe you are uh, making an excess of purity or, or, or special uh, ideas on our own mind or on our own language. Um, well, <laughs> yeah. well, well, well I, I, I think Luke will, will knows more about that because he has a, a, he says a, he was a trained in linguistics, right? You studied linguistics. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, but yeah, but for example, I I know very because I was very fond of uh, when I was in my PhD in Toulouse, I came up with some uh, works of Ferdinand de Saussure, so the one the, could say the father of modern linguistics possibly, about the the, the signifier and the the, the significant and significant, no, the signi the, and 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 for that you need a model of the world. I mean, language models are. They call it language models, and in my opinion, I'm not sure it is a very, a very fortunate term again. Eh? But let's call, it, let's call it language models. Uh, but what they don't are, they, what they don't are not, what they don't have is a model of the world. And to me, it's very difficult to to, to believe that uh, an AI system can have uh, the notational semantics without a model of the world. So notational semantics would be along the lines of of the Saussure, right? So you have uh, the, the 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 term. 
And then the, what the term refers to, which is objects in the world and things in the world around us, right? And if you only have one of these two, uh, let's say, uh, legs, uh, this does, uh, AI systems will, in my opinion, will never be able to uh, truly understand, understand the, the language without, I am, I am very, very fond of, of the, the embodied approaches to AI because it's the, a very good way to learn, um, to, have a, to acquire a knowledge of the world. What, what, what's your take, Luke? Yeah, well, the, the, the hypothesis that you um, formulate is a very interesting one, and I think uh, is also being discussed. And, uh, for example, Hinton, who uh, yes, got Hinton, the Nobel yeah. Prize a few weeks ago, you know, would actually say that. Mm. So there are people in AI mm -hmm. who would subscribe to that and say, you know, just like if I may make a biological comparison in, uh, let's say, swarm intelligence, you know, like an ant colony. I say, oh, it's remarkable. I mean, they build these, uh, mm -hmm. they make these pots, they build these nests. There must be some coordinator somewhere. Well, in fact, we know from complex systems that no, there is no coordinator. There is actually almost no intelligence in these ants. Mm -hmm. You know, they follow very simple rules and then they build systems that we say, wow, there must be an intelligence somewhere, but it is not there. Okay. <laughs> and so it is possible that, you know, we also, even though we think we have a mind, <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, and that we are intelligent. The only thing we do is statistics and, and use statistics to replay uh, the patterns that we already had. So th this is a, a hypothesis which, well, I think it is wrong uh, for many reasons, particularly also for language, you know, because we say things. If I now make a sentence, you know, I'm not saying I'm not thinking, oh, what is the, the next word that is the most common word that has been in all the text that I've ever seen? No. I, when I say something, it's because I want to express meaning to you. Mm -hmm. I want to discuss with you. And, you know, so you have this mapping of meanings and functions to language, mm -hmm. which is not happening in, in these large language models. Now, yeah. the same thing, you know, just compare it, let's say, in mathematics, okay? So, AI is now also being used in mathematics with actually very interesting outcomes. And it's not just the, the uh, chat GPT kind of AI, but it's also the theory improving, you know, the symbolic AI, yeah. actually. Now, the outcomes that are there, and in that sense, AI can be useful for science, is because of massive computing power, you can examine, you know, lots of cases, which if we would have to do this by hand, it would be, you know, we wouldn't do it. The same thing with the protein folding, okay, the other Nobel Prize. There's a massive computation search, in fact. So the symbolic mm. uh, approach to AI with then also deep learning as a way to speed up, learn mm. heuristics and, and things like that. So it's a combination. Yes. Yeah. Um, now, the, uh, but again, so th this is where AI can be useful as support to the scientists, like the, the mathematician, you know, who knows. And so not a GPT that is given all the proofs in the world and then is making up new proofs by, by predicting <clears throat> the next word in a proof, but by knowing the axioms, by knowing inference rules, you know, applying the inference rules. So I think, I, I wouldn't say nothing can co come out of it. In fact, a lot can come out of it. But the blind uh, hope that this empiricist approach is, is thanks to a lot of data that we now have, is going to do our job, I think, is a, is a mistake. So there's more to it, there's more to the human mind than this particular thing. Thank you, Luke Ramon. We've got now...
Can you some more? Can you some? Excuse me. Uh, we've got about five minutes. We've got quite a lot of questions on it with our virtual audience. So uh, we've got a question here, and then we'll try to to make a couple of the online ones. Okay. Thank you very much. In a very quick way, thank you for your presentations. Uh, I work as a um, Deputy Director for Statistics for the National PES in, in Spain currently. Deputy Director for Statistics in, in Spain now. Public administrations produce a huge amount of data, huge amount of data. Employment services, health services, social services, and, and so on. Uh, these data, big companies, big IT companies claim usually for this data to fit their uh, AI products. Uh, nice products, but these products also generate recommendations, also generate uh, political decisions, budgetary decisions, operative decisions. And these decisions directly affect people's rights, people's life. My question is, this artificial intelligence applied to public administrations should be mandatory developed using open codes. Is it feasible? Public administration? I don't know. Well, I, I I missed some of some, you know. Yeah. Some, yeah. Does not exist. Though. Well, there is a yeah. for public administration. There is very recent, actually, yesterday, in fact, a release of uh, a kind of AI system which has been trained with regulations, laws, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how to fill in forms, which in the UK, they, they are trying out with businesses to see uh, whether aspects of a public administration could be, could be done that way. Now I'm, I'm holding my breath, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's already very difficult to deal with it uh, is. public administrations as a, as a citizen. But instead of reducing the simplicity of or the complexity, <laughs> reducing complexity of administration. So I think what you should really do is not by adding no. AI to it and then uh, yeah. then I'm really worried. But yeah digitalization digitalization it should was supposed to you know to lower the the, 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 the workload and make things easier. And we are witnessing that is not the, the, the other way around. I mean, yeah, yes, it's much more complicated in now, nowadays to do many things dealing with the public administration because of digitalization. Digitalization is it could be good in principle, but I think it's is not is not being done properly. That's the problem. That's the problem. We should perhaps be a little bit more leave the, the, the an open door to an all, uh, to an all, uh, not to digital to yes, an, yes, an, an, analog. analog. You know, have always this, let's say, no backup. Or I don't know how to call it, because it's been done very, very badly. And if we add uh, AI, I'm afraid things might might become even even worse. Maybe. Yeah. Okay, we, we're gonna go with the, I think the last question One? from the online audience. Ah, all right. Oh, uh, we, we should. Ask, okay, we're gonna do one online. If we go a little quick. We can do another one here. Yes. Okay. So, uh, do you think it's wrong to teach the basics of AI and generative AI in secondary schools? What do you think of uh, large language models like Hugging Chat, when they offer a large, large language models based on training with legal data and open systems? Thank you. Well, I have a comment on the. Comment. You know the. Uh, Maybe it's important to say that AI is a difficult subject. It's as difficult as physics, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the mathematics of it and everything. Uh, also, the, the, uh, these experiments, you know, are really on the edge of computer science in terms of complexity of running, of using, uh, processing and everything. Mm -hmm. So the idea to to teach AI to, what was it, primary school, secondary, secondary school. I mean, we have a bit of experience in, in Brussels now. We, uh, they started a, uh, a bachelor degree in AI. Mm. 50 students started. 
In the first year, in the second year, five students are left. Why is that? Because, you know, the students who choose it, they think it's an easy subject, but it is not. I mean, you, it is a scientific field with all the rigors and, uh, you know, you need to know, the, the, understand the mathematics and statistics and, and the whole lot. And uh, mm -hmm. so, <clears throat> I mean, and also you cannot expect that the children are critical enough to see that what is produced by one of these systems is wrong. I mean, they first they have to learn to to calculate, to write, to read in particular. You know, they have to read written texts before they, they should ask ChatGPT to write their homework and you know to 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 give like a prompt and and their text. No, that they should learn. So actually, mm. I'm totally against it. Mm. Well, yeah, I, I think I think exactly the same. Indeed. Okay, so we have another last question from our audience. Good evening. Um, first oh, of all, thank you for sharing your language. Uh, I'm Maria, I'm studying philosophy in the Universidad de Barcelona, I'm in my last year actually, and my question and daily concern is what do we have to do now? What um, younger generations have to do with all these issues? Because everybody everywhere is talking uh, about these issues, how the, the whole impact and everything, but nobody is guiding us, is telling us what do we have to do now, what path do we have to follow, what steps do we have to take uh, to um, find a solution or to contribute uh, with all this social and um, technological, te sorry, technological or whatever issues that artificial intelligence is. No, I missed part of the question. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry, but the, the sound the, is difficult. Yeah, Maybe you can. Sometimes they allow, well, my, the microphone is even not, worse. Think, yeah, okay. Nobody's telling them what to do. What they, to do? Yeah, what, what nobody's telling. About, about the social challenges. What do we have to do now, the younger generations, uh, to contribute uh, on a solution? or some solutions uh, of the issues that AI is presenting us. A solution to what? To all the issues. All the issues? Well, or maybe some of them, because everybody's no, no, talking maybe, about it, yeah. but... Oof. Okay, okay, I understand, but uh, I think, well, it depends really on what, what, uh, what you're doing, right? What task you have in mind, but for example, for scientists, I think it is really important to, to uh, acquire the computational skills, whatever field you're in, and they include AI techniques, machine learning, data science, you know. I mean, you, you see very clearly that advances at the moment, like the protein folding or other, are, are based on very sophisticated use of computing. And so computer science has to be the first step, actually, and if, if you know that, then you can go, AI is part of computer science. So, um, so th this is one. Now, if you, uh, I think for other tools, there are lots of tools that, that are now on the market that are integrated in systems, and then you can try to use them, but if they are designed to be usable mm. by, by anyone, you know, you don't need the, the, the children in secondary school, they probably know more about the tools that are on, on a smartphone than their teachers. So this is not something you, do, you have to do in schools. Uh, but so I think these tools, you know, you, you can use them, download them, try them. Uh, so that's, that's what you could do in, in other uh, areas. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I was uh, not this, when was last year? No, this year. This year, in summer this year, there was this uh, workshop on, on AI and uh, education. And there were 
uh, teachers from primary and high secondary school. And some of them, they were explaining what they were doing uh, in AI in their classrooms. Of course, no, no, no one, no one can, can teach really the, the deep, deeply about AI, because as you said, there are lots of mathematics prerequisites, requirements that are, that are not possible, it's not possible to have, uh, to have them, uh, to have learned that when you are you know, 16 or 17 years or, seven, or even 18 years old. But uh, I remember uh, quite an, an, ex an interesting experience by one secondary school teacher that he managed to, to really make this, the students understand, uh, to have some algorithmic thinking about what is going on uh, in, a in a recommender system, for example, you, see, you picked up, you picked up a very, you pick up a very concrete, a very concrete uh, aspect of AI, like recommenders. You know, when you like, and uh, the, this, this is something that is very common, and everybody uh, uses it, right? Uh, when you buy Amazon's and all that, YouTube, uh, etc. And he managed his, his plain the details of the experience, and without going into the mathematics, obviously, and without going into the the, the, not even the, 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 the computer coding, but they managed, uh, he managed that this, uh, the students were grasped very nicely, uh, apparently, uh, what is behind the workings, how, we, how a recommender system works. And, and, and they did in, in the classroom some even a concrete uh, application, uh, not coding it, because it was a very simple one, but uh, the students go and, and would play the role of the processor of a, of a, of the of the computing of the computer right of the algorithm. So themselves they were they were uh, uh, executing let's say the 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 the, the code of, of of the of the algorithm. So this this is a way to convey some algorithmic way of thinking, which maybe is maybe is an important thing to 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 teach. Uh, not only that, of course, but. I, I wouldn't object, I think it's not a bad idea to introduce some of this algorithmic thinking into in high school, perhaps. So now well, we should close the, the event. I think a, a very good thing to do is also being cu curious as, as you are coming here to, to this event today. We should close. So to close this event, I would like to express my gratitude to the Real Academia de Ciencias y Artes de Barcelona for hosting this special in this special venue, and of course to the Academia Europea Knowledge Hub uh, for organizing this gathering. The work is essential in promoting and sharing science, uh, bringing it closer to the public and enriching our knowledge as a society. Of course, I want to thank. Uh, Professors Luke Stills and Ramon Lopez de Mantaras for being here. Thank you all for your participation and for joining us in this meaningful exchange. Thank you very much. Mm.